What is up, everybody? It's Tuesday, September 6th. We are five days away from the NFL season. This is your daily dog take for Tuesday. I'm your host, Jacob at Roachism13, joined by Mr. Jack Duffin from the OBR and Over the Cap. I am excited to talk about the Browns roster from top to bottom. Guys, first, real quick from our sponsors, if you guys are looking to get decked out in Browns merch for this weekend, go no look no further than homage. I've got the, the Miles Garrett, Nick Chubb NFL Jam shirt going on here. Uh, they got one with with both the all pro guards that you can check out. They just released the victory Monday merch uh, blitz, the league merch They're They're dropping here soon. All kinds of really great stuff. If you're watching on Twitter, I'll put it in the comments below. I'll put it in the YouTube description, in the audio description, a link to, to the Browns collections. You should click on that and check it out. Um, Jack, I talked to you about this uh, kind of as we we're leading up to this episode. I just kind of wanted to go over some overall roster construction questions and some things with you getting ready for Sunday. Um, I talked about this on yesterday's pod as it uh, retain, uh, refers to the wide receiver room. And um, I know Jake does this a lot on his pods um, on the OBR film breakdown. And he always talks about how he can see why, like, he's like, Oh, I can see why you signed this guy. I don't know if it'll work out, but I can see the traits that you liked and maybe where you thought this would go. I can understand why you thought, Schwartz would be good, you know, some things like that. So I'm trying to look at it from that angle, from the wide receiver room as it's currently constructed, because I think that if they add anybody, it'll be post week one now. I don't think it's going to be in time after this weekend comes and goes. And I am trying to figure out, like, why is it they feel like this is going to be enough? And I think the wild card for me is Mike Woods. So I'm really interested to hear if you agree. I mean, I was there at camp before he goes down. And I was like, oh, hey, this guy has shown me more than what I could, what I thought. Because when he was drafted, I was like, oh, I don't think this guy makes the roster. I don't know what's going on here. But I think they really think that David Bell and Mike Woods can give more than what people think. Uh, do you kind of agree with that? Or where are you overall on the wide receiver construction? So for me, I think we're going to see unprecedented levels of two tight end sets. I think we're going to be rivaling, and I need to go back and look at the numbers of Gronk and Hernandez um, for the Patriots. I, I've said for a while, I think it will be about 50% because that tends to be what it is. It's sort of 50% two tight ends, uh, two wide receivers, one running back. So uh, 12 personnel. And then it's sort of 50% is three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back. You get a little odd bit of mm -hmm. stuff, but that's effectively what the system is. I'm not sure. We might see two thirds, 75% where they just go, hey, we're going to call David Njoku a wide receiver. We'll just stick him in the slot, and that's what we're going to go do. So I think it might be a massive amount of confidence in Harrison Bryant um, because, you know, Njoku's a player, whereas they might feel that he's going to go out there and play a lot, and you're going to free Njoku up to do a load of bits. But they must feel good about Bell and Woods. But even without that, they... They didn't act in free agency when they could have. So even before going into the draft, they must have felt really good, else they'd have gone out and got another name. Yeah, they had Jakeem Grant, but was he going to be all that? I don't really think so. So I, I think it's got to be David Njoku, who they are absolutely in love with, which is bizarre considering they were feeding the ball more to Hooper than Njoku only a year ago. So that, that's sort of where my feeling's at. Uh, but... After week one, if it's not going well, whether you pick up the phone, get a Darius Slayton trade, but probably more likely it's a Cole Beasley, it's a T.Y. Hilton, it's just some free agent to go, hey, we're not going to pay you much, but just come in here. You know, I, and I love David Njoku, so that's music to my ears. I'm a, a big David Njoku guy. I will fight you on the internet for David Njoku. I will, I'll go full bore about it. So, you know, and Kevin Stefanski talked about that today. The it, During his press conference, I, I saw a clip from Fred Greetham where he had said, you know, that, you know, they're going to put a lot on him physically and mentally, and they think that Njoku's ready for it. And I do think that that Hooper stuff, I think it was just so bizarre because I, I just don't know how you justify it. I don't know how you look at that tape and you're just like, you know what? Don't care. Going to keep doing it. See what happens. I, yeah, that that to me, that was like kind of a just this weird thing with the David Njoku. See, I like that though, like kind of supplementing it with that. I think maybe some, even some Kareem Hunt in the slot. I think they did the Browns have some weird amount of, uh, of snap counts comparative to the rest of the league where they like motioned the running back into the wide receiver broom or something like that last year. I thought it was like some weird number 
um, about that that I thought, you know, that's a, that's really interesting. Listen, this is a conspiracy theory. And I heard it. And you mentioning like, you know, bringing in someone like Cole Beasley or T.O.I. Hilton that's out there. If it doesn't work, we quill and do you think there's any chance, and you're going to laugh when I bring this up, when I, when I mention this, and I'm, yes, do you think there is any chance that Deshaun Watson, like, links up in some way with Odell Beckham during his suspension, and it leads to OBJ signing in November or December as Watson is coming back? Do you think there's any, any chance that happens? I think it's certainly plausible, but it's going to need the Browns to be in contention. So that's going to rely a lot on Jacoby Brissett and what's going on there. But if they're in contention come the end of the season, and it's if Deshaun want, if no, if OBJ wants to go out there and practice with an NFL level quarterback before he signs for anyone, there is one, um, and that isn't Blake Bortles. <laughs> that is Deshaun Watson, who he got and practice with. And then the same on uh, Watson's side. If he wants to go out there and train with wide receivers. OBJ sort of coming healthy near the end of his suspension is a sort of obvious place for him to go. Um, so there is a lot that makes sense. There is more sensible destinations that if he's going to do the slightly end of the year, he can go and sign the team that's definitely going to the playoffs, gives him an extra one, two, maybe three games of tape that he can show off ready for free agency next year. So while it's unlikely, there is still a lot of things that make sense. And if he can come back and show, actually, I can do this. I just needed a better quarterback. He would. He, all players have sort of that chip on their shoulder. That sort of that they, they want to show someone else up that it's their fault. That would be a perfect <laughs> fu. That yeah, and, and and it does feel like that based on some of his comments since leaving. That that there is some of that in Odell. Um, and I. <sighs> I wish he was wrong, but I don't necessarily think that he was wrong when it comes to that. Let's shift a little bit to the defense. We're kind of going to jump around here at these, these quick hitter podcasts uh, each morning. I want to talk about the defensive tackle room um, just for, for a brief moment. I'm looking at it and I was of the proponent that adding a veteran kind of made sense. Um, I'm actually incredibly in, intrigued by them switching David Moore to defensive tackle because I saw an image of him the other day and I was like, oh my god, I did, why wasn't he already a defensive tackle? Like that, that is a big immovable object. I like what Jordan Elliott showed. I thought in the preseason, I thought I saw a dude that actually looks like a defensive tackle, not an edge rusher playing defensive tackle, which is what it felt like for me for the two games. I kind of tend to believe I don't know what Togi and Winfrey can give you. But I think those top two guys can give you average play. I, I truly think they could be average. Where are you at overall on that? Do you think they can be average? Do you think it's depth? Do you think it's the whole room? What's the problem there overall with defensive tackles? Yeah, so obviously on David Moore, congrats that he got out of Gremlin State two years ago and not stuck with uh, Hugh Jackson. Um, obviously, because I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, no. But... If we look at the room, so I'm happy with the two starters. So Taven Bryant, Jordan Elliott, I'm fine with. Um, it's not sexy. It's not going to be top half of the league, but they'll be okay. And if you want more plugged in there, well, is it coming from the edge room, the cornerback room in terms of draft picks, in terms of big free agent spending? But there is one dynamic that kind of makes sense because I don't really want to get rid of any of those four because the plan's pretty obvious from the front office. I think it's more or less the same way they've got planned for linebacker. It's spend a little bit of money on one dude and everyone else is sort of third to fifth round draft picks. And they're just going to keep cycling it through. They'll bring in one every year and then they'll just keep doing a year through until ideally you've got four cheap dudes for defensive tackle and you've got, say, five cheap dudes and a uh, one guy on a little bit of money for linebackers. So that's kind of what I think the vision is. With defensive tackle, what you can do, though, because there's nine on the defensive line, the edge room's pretty awesome. The top three, really, really happy with. You've got two studs and you've got Alex Wright. Then you've got this choice between Chase Winovich and um, Isaiah Thomas. What you could do is move one of them on and bring in a, a Nadomakan Sue, a uh, Sheldon Richardson. They're the two names that make most sense for me. Um, and that way you can improve the defensive tackle room without throwing sort of the numbers off because they've always had nine on the defensive line. It's just where you um, set that up. So I think if you're going to do
do something, bring in one of those guys. I would let Chase Winovich go and trust in Alex Wright. Um, you've got Rochelle on the practice squad that if you need to elevate someone because of injury or even game day, you could do that. Um, so I think they're in a really, really nice position there to move Winovich off. He's more of a pure pass rusher. And at the end of the day, we're probably not going to be in a position where we're blowing up games and we're relying on the other team that they're only going to be passing the ball. Yeah. There's no chance for a run because we're not 20 points ahead or 14 points ahead. Just the, the state of where the roster's at. Um, and just the reality of where the Browns currently sit. So I think that makes a lot of sense to bring in a Sue, a Richardson, and change Chase Winovich out. Because I like Rochelle, and that for me is just a nice piece of security. So that that's a move I'd certainly consider making. And I and I really enjoy these new practice squad rules with the ability. Is it four they can call up each week or three? It's something I, like that. I think it's three, but I'm not sure if it's even limited. I think they can just call, they can call players up. It might oh, yeah. be three, it might be four, but they only have it's 48 that are active, but nine of them must be eight of them. Eight of them must be offensive linemen. Um, pretty sure that's what the rule is. That yeah. um, you allow 47, but if eight are offensive linemen, you're allowed 48. Um, and the other thing to remember with defensive tackle is the two starters are good, as I said. But you expect those guys to play 40, 45, may it, let, let's even say 50% of snaps. Mm-hmm. Let's go full up, it's 60. So mm-hmm. that's 60, 60. That's 120% of snaps with two defensive tackles. Let's throw in some um, edges dropping in there, 15%. Happy days, let's say that. So now we've got 135%. That's still... 65% that have got yeah. to become Togi and Winfrey. That's what worries me. Whereas if you have three dudes where you'll go, all of these guys play 60%, Togi and Winfrey, Winfrey can basically be inactive for half the season while he develops, which is fine. If you're a defensive tackle, you're a tight end, you don't really expect much out of a rookie because the nearer to the ball and middle of the play you get, it just takes time to build the size and deal with the monsters the other side. So that way I suddenly feel good if we're looking at Sue, Brian, um, Elliot, all play 60% of snaps, 10% for Togiai, 20% for your um, Garrett, Clowney, Roy, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. any of those guys drop in there. And that way I think it fits nice. So sneaking the third one on, I, I think it's good because I don't want to see Togiai or Winfrey playing snaps, if I'm honest. I, I feel like I can live with Winfrey on like third and long. That that's about the only one that I really can live with, and that's not very much. It's like a handful of snaps a game I can live with. But I I, I got to admit, there's there is maybe only one person on this planet that is a bigger Alex Wright stand than I am, and it's probably it's it's probably Corey Cannon because he's probably got me a little bit on that. Although me and him have this this like back and forth about about trying to go. I've got a '94 jersey in the closet, man. Like I'm I'm full bore. I'm full bore all in on the Alex Wright train. Oh, he, I want to talk about next year. Hundred percent. Clowney is gone. It's his last year. He's out. Alex Wright. Write that name in pen. That is a three-year starter from twenty-three mm-hmm. to twenty-five. And yeah, then 20. who knows? We'll see what happens then. Because it's it's unfortunate, but twenty twenty-six. That's probably a down a down and sort of a decline for Miles Garrett. Just because yeah. hey, he's going to be thirty something, and not many thirty-plus-year-olds are competing for the. Defensive player, player of the yeah. league. Yeah, not not anymore. <laughs> um, it, the, the thing too, like Alex Wright, I just think when you talk about sliding those guys inside, I think on those run snaps, I think Alex Wright can be in, inside on those runs and he can kind of be one of the counter punches to like this. Like people talk that the Browns are kind of inviting people to run up the middle and they are. They absolutely are. I think he can be a counter punch on some of those. I think, I think him next to Clowney, I, like in run support, I mean, you, that's taking away that side almost. It's like, hey, I need to run to this other side because these guys over here, they can, they 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 stand their ground, they can anchor that 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 middle. So I got one more for you as we start to wrap this thing up. Um, I saw a tweet from you uh, today or yesterday, but we're recording this on on Monday for people that don't know why I can't figure out what day it is. Um, we talked about the Joe Haig signing, uh, and you kind of talked about. Uh, 
being intrigued if they call him a tackle or a guard. And that's always intriguing to me because they always called Dawson Deaton a, a guard. And he, in my mind, was a center. So that was always kind of interesting. Um, you, you you mentioned that they never had five tackles week one before and that he's here as insurance for Conklin. But what does that say about the other guys? And I wanted to ask, because I talked about this yesterday in terms of Hubbard and Conklin both being, I think the team is worried about long-term this year, maybe not right out the gate, but long-term, can they provide us with these things? I like James Hudson a lot and I like Alex Taylor a lot. But is this kind of an indication that their preference is allow is to allow those two to continue to develop before seeing the field? I think it's the statement that one of those two they don't feel great with. And I, th- I think it's probably mostly a statement about Alex Taylor. Because if you feel great about Alex Taylor and you're like, because he, he's still not had one season where he's been on the roster for six years. So if you elevated him now, you've got him dirt cheap for three years and then he's a restricted free agent the year after. So you could easily have moved him on there. And we had this discussion at the OBR of looking at, could they have kept five tackles, Alex Taylor over a Drew Forbes, over a throw hole. Um, and if they re- really loved him, there is no way they go out and they sign um, Haig. And people said, oh, but what about this? And it's like, well, you, you just don't. Because yeah. there's no way you're going this cheap player that we could have for three years. Because if someone phones up Alex Taylor now and goes, hey, we're putting you on our roster, he's gone. Um, and it, we haven't seen that Haig terms on the deal yet. And I, I'm not expecting silly money, but it's that statement that it says. Because if you love what Hudson could be and you're like, hey, we're happy with him playing week one. Alex Taylor, we've got a lot of promise. We're, we're ready to really push something. Then those guys are both on the roster and you're not making a move. So it could be that they still love Hudson. Hubbard is the one that's got the injury and they don't trust Alex Taylor because that could easily be the case where that's there. But there is some dynamic between Hudson, Hubbard and Alex Taylor where there is a weak link. And it, it's probably two out of the three that it could be that Hubbard just needs two more weeks to be fully healthy. Apparently, both were practicing Conklin and Hubbard today, but it could be they're practicing. Um, I've, I'm dropping quote marks for anyone who's listening to the, the podcast, um, but the, it, he's not quite ready. So there is a dynamic there that there is a question to be asked. It's probably more about Alex Taylor, but people saying, no, you're reading too much into it. If they love Alex Taylor, he's not on the practice squad. In the same way as if suddenly, say, Greedy Williams, there's injury concerns around, and they go out and sign a corner. Well, that does speak volumes to yes. AJ Green, to Martin Emerson. That they're not quite ready yet, and that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it would also say, hey, they obviously don't trust Jolly to come in and be the fifth corner right away, which is fair enough. But it every move speaks volumes of what they think about different people because you can't trust anything they say remember no. is our guy josh rosen's not getting traded we hear all these things they've got to say that stuff take it all with a pinch of salt and judge the actions yeah all right jack before i let you out of here man give me your week one give me a score prediction i'm gonna say brown's 24 it's 20 or 21 I, I, can I have both? Can I have 20.5? Yes. Um, I'm going to say the Panthers somewhere in that 20, 20.5. Uh, I, I think it's one that is going to be a fun game. There's going to be times where you look at Baker and you say, oh, I wish I still had that guy at quarterback. And then there's other times you're going to be like, oh, wow, thank God we got rid of him. Um, people are like, way, w- w- which side of the Baker roller coaster you see? We've watched Baker long enough. It's not, It was never just one or the other. No. There was times when you were like, he just threw the ball at Minka Fitzpatrick. And then the next ball he's throwing and it's deep and it's great. And it, it, it's so fast and it's going to be interesting. You're not going to see anything sexy from Brissett. It's going to be just move the chains constantly. Um, and that's perfectly fine. Don't get excited and expect 20, 30-yard bombs. Can he just keep passing the ball and we'll slowly move the chains down? And who knows, it might need a cave your kick because we can't move the chains all 80 yards, say, if we can get 45, 50, we might be able to punt, uh, kick in. I mean, he's bombing them from the other side of the 50. So let's just, let's roll it. I love it. I love Kate York. I'm like all aboard the Kate York train. All right, Jack, Eight I really. Better than three. That, well, you know, this, it's, that's true. I appreciate you taking the time out uh, to talk to with me tonight, man. Um, 
we will be live tonight. The Barkin Brown Show is live tonight, 8 p.m. on Network 216 Twitch. I hope to see you guys there. Otherwise, I will see you guys again tomorrow, bright and early. Go Browns. Go Browns.